Hey, everybody, welcome to the Addiction Unlimited podcast, where you get to learn everything you want to know about addiction and recovery. I'm your host, Angela Pugh, co founder of Kansas City Recovery, life coach, and recovering alcoholic. To learn more about me, you can listen to episode zero on your podcast app or find us on the web at addictionunlimited.com. Hello, my friend. Welcome back to another episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast. I'm your coach, Angela Pugh. If you are looking for inspiration to get more energy, lose some extra pounds, get rid of your achy joints, improve your skin and digestion, you've come to the right place. My guest today is Netta Gorman, and her passion is to inspire you to live a happy and healthy, sugar-free life that you love. Netta spent most of her 30s and early 40s struggling with chronic digestion issues, but she wasn't making the connection between her digestion issues and her love for sugary desserts. So when all the suggestions and solutions she was getting from doctors weren't working, she decided to take matters into her own hands and make some major dietary changes just to see if it would help. And it seems like it changed everything. She's here with me today to share with you how making these changes brought her a life of freedom, freedom from cravings, freedom from energy crashes, freedom from that love-hate relationship that we all understand so well, and from all the health issues that she had. And this topic resonates with me so much on a personal level because I've been on my own journey to give up sugar but also on a professional level because most of my clients in my six-week program struggle with exactly this thing. And we see it consistently come up in our private Facebook groups and forums. So I knew I needed to spend more time talking about this and bring you, my audience, more information, inspiration, and how-to steps to make this a reality if that's what you want or need. I'll tell you, it's been a game changer for me and surprising in many ways, and we can get more into that later. But right now, I want to welcome Netta to the show and to my incredible audience who I love and adore. Netta, thank you for coming on and bringing this conversation to my audience. I'm so grateful to have you here. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah. Why don't we take a second, just tell everyone a little bit about you and what you do. All right. So my name is Netta and um, I originally am from the UK, as you can hear, but I've been living in French speaking Canada and Quebec for over 30 years. And as you mentioned, all through my adult years, especially in my 30s and into my 40s, I had awful digestion and, and awful digestive problems, chronic constipation, amongst other things. Um, and also I s- really struggled with anxiety, depression, and um, inf- and infertility, fertility issues. We managed to have our daughter, but it was a long, hard ride. And yeah, as you said, I didn't realize any of this had to do with sugar. And I was really the dessert queen <laughs> at the time. I mean, any anyone who knew me knew that if they made an extra dessert for me, then it would be a hit <laughs> at a dinner party. And I considered that I was just normal. I ate what I now consider to be dessert for breakfast, lunch and dinner, really, uh, and snacks included. And I just thought it was normal. And I didn't think that I ate a particularly high amount of sugar. I didn't think that it had anything to do with my health issues or my digestion. I honestly thought I was normal. (laughs) And it's just that my definition of normal has changed since then. Sure. So the biggest change happened when I was 45. And that's when I was, I tell you, between you and me, I was going to the bathroom like once a week. Um, which you can imagine is toxic mm-hmm. for the body, very uncomfortable, bloating, pain, just toxic. And I just, I tried everything the doctors had asked me to do to get my digestion going. Um, and then I consulted with actually a nutritional therapist who was working with my brother in the States. And she said, look, just as an experiment, why don't you cut out sugar, but not just sugar, sugar, sweeteners and flour <laughs> for two weeks to see if that could help. And I was like, no, 
<laughs> no way. <laughs> I just, I could not see why I would stop eating the only foods that gave me comfort to help with my digestive mm-hmm. issues. You know, it was like a vicious yeah. cycle. And so I resisted um, for a long time, weeks, if not months, until the day when I realized things aren't getting any better. And what have I got to lose? I might as well give it a go. Give it a yeah. try. It is hard. And it's so funny to me. There's so much that you just said that resonates with me so much because I think over the last 10 years of my life, for sure, like even people that don't know me well would know that I'm totally a sugar addict, right? Like it's the thing that you kind of, just like when I was drinking and I was the party girl, right? Like desserts kind of became that thing too. Everybody knew that I was crazy for desserts and would always eat desserts. And also that I literally, if I could get away with it with no consequences, I would eat nothing but sugar all day, every day. I mean, it would just be candy and pastries and yeah, I would be really out of control. And I got pretty out of control. (laughs) Right, right. And it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. I mean, what other drug in air quotes do we give our children, you know, and do we... Actually, it's actually, I have more pressure on me now that I'm sugar free than I ever did when I was consuming all that sugar and chocolate and desserts. It was socially not just acceptable, but encouraged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is, it is everywhere, right? It's so funny how when I talk about this, just the parallels with alcohol and alcoholism is, it's crazy to me how similar the journeys really, really are. Now, one thing I find fascinating is that the two-week thing, right? She said, give up sugar for two weeks. And that seems like such a short period of time. So what did you notice just in two weeks? What were some of the significant things that made you want to continue doing it? Yes. Well, in the first, I would say day three and four, and I kept a log on my Facebook page, actually. But on day three and four, um, I actually on day three, I said to my husband, look, I'm just going to go for a quick nap. And I think I slept through the next two days. <laughs> um, because my body, I knew I know this now, I didn't know it at the time. But my body was reacting to the lack of sugar, the lack of that source of energy and was like, hey, I'm checking out for a while. I cannot handle this. And so I just couldn't function. But the funny thing was, and, you know, it's only two days in the space of the last almost eight years that I ended up, you know, not actually going back to sugar. But after those couple of days, I after about the first week, I would say, I got up one morning and thought, my joints don't ache anymore. My movements are more supple. And then I was like, well, my little spare tire is starting to melt away. What's happening? And I had this sort of energy, and not just energy as in I can climb Mount Everest today because I still couldn't do that today, but <laughs> but it was like I have this zest for life. I feel like I'm enthusiastic about life. I want to get up and go. And I never really experienced that before. And I, saw, I, I loved yeah. it. And I thought after the second week, I thought, you know, I just want to have a bit more of this see where it takes me. So whereas the nutritional therapist said to me after two weeks, you know, you can start reintroducing certain foods with sugar and or flour. And I said, no, here I go again saying, no, don't you tell me what to do, (laughs) which is part of my personality. And I said, actually, I think I'm going to carry on for another week. And I sort of took it week by week. And I just got hooked on feeling great. And I never look back. And that's this sort of the simple version of the story. Yeah. I've shared with my audience many times, like there were so many years of my life that I really thought like I had chronic fatigue syndrome or something. Like I just had no energy. And now I understand it was a combination of a lot of things. But when I started to really shift my diet, it was its own miracle, like how different I felt. And 
And that was one of the first pieces for me of understanding, like, I don't have chronic fatigue. I'm tired all the time because I eat like crap, right? right. Like, there's no actual nutritional value in anything I was eating for so long. It was all fake food. Exactly. And I, you know, I like to tell people that, that I help now that our collective definition of what food is needs to be reevaluated as a society. And even the messages that we get from a lot of the nutritionists and the dietitians out there, not all of them, but a lot of them, that, you know, sugar should be part of our diets, that we need some fun and we need to have enjoy our food. And I agree with the fun and the enjoying your food 100%. I just don't think it necessarily has to come from sugar. Right, right. What is the difference between sugar and fake sugar? Do you mean sweeteners? Yes. Yes. Um, well, for the brain, when you taste a sweet taste, no difference. So the same receptors are going to be fired. The same dopamine response is going to happen. Um, and so makers of fake sweeteners or keto sweeteners will say, well, they don't actually cause a blood sugar spike, which depending on which studies you've chosen to cherry pick is mm -hmm. true or not true. <laughs> um, and actually, it's not so much the blood sugar spike that we should be looking out for. It's more um, the production of insulin. And you can actually have an insulin spike without a blood sugar spike. But, you know, I'll leave it up to the scientists and the doctors to fight it out between them of whether yes or no, it's going to affect your blood sugar or your dopamine or your um, insulin. But for most of us, what happens when we taste something that is sweet and sometimes even starchy foods made with flour that's not even sweet tasting is that it triggers this dopamine response, which I'm sure your listeners are familiar with. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and that is different for each person, but there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of us who experience this reaction. Yeah. I mean, listen, in this circle, like that's what we live for. <laughs> People with addiction, right. we do everything for that dopamine hit. That's how we can, we that's, yeah, yeah, that's how we get ourselves in trouble in so many different areas is chasing that sort of dopamine hit. I remember years ago, I heard a comedian talking about food and organic food. And he was doing this whole bit about organic food. And he started talking about how, you know, the special labels and the preparation process and whatever they have to be to be labeled organic and how much more expensive organic foods can be. And then he said, he said, you know, when I was a kid, this was just food. <laughs> because yes. when we were kids, food was just food and everything was made from scratch, right? It wasn't all of this so much processed and pre-prepared and all of that. It has just made a huge, huge difference in society for sure. Totally, totally. You know, in North America, um, especially, a lot of people that come to see me for help to get sugar free are just, they don't even know, it, through no fault of their own, and I include myself, just don't know what actual food is. And I remember when I also got this list of foods from the nutritional therapist, and I was like, well, what, what am I going to eat? And she's like, food right, <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> mind blown and really it's it's really the foods that we usually find on the perimeter the outskirts of a grocery store for the, it's basically ingredients that we eat rather than products that have a list of ingredients right so for me i'm an omnivore you know meat fish seafood fruit and vegetables um, I eat fermented dairy. I don't actually drink milk, but that's just my personal choice. But I make my own yogurt, my own milk kefir, and I make a lot of fermented foods and drinks um, for gut health and eggs and nuts and seeds. And there are thousands, hundreds of thousands of combinations to make dishes and recipes. And I think, yes, I think our collective definition of food and our collective definition of variety mm -hmm. <laughs> 
also needs to be reevaluated so that we are the ones who decide what food is and we don't give that power to the processed foods industry. Yeah, because they will utilize that power for evil. And they have. And they have, yeah. I just did this year, um, at 2023, for those of you listening, <laughs> in January, I just did Whole30 with one of my girlfriends. And she would reached out to me. She's like, would you do this with me? And I love to always be working on my self-discipline and really challenging myself to do hard things and be committed, right? So when she brought it up to me, I was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, I've already been on this food journey anyway. And I gave up sugar in um, August, or I gave up desserts, I should say, in August of 2022. So I had fought through that, which by the way, honest to God truth, is the most difficult thing I have ever quit. I quit yep. drinking pretty easily. I quit. I was a smoker for 20 years. I quit smoking pretty easily. Giving up sugar was by far the hardest thing I have done. But yeah, I believe you. Yeah, in that whole 30 process, when it's exactly what you're saying, I had this initial meltdown of thinking, like just really focusing on all the things I wasn't going to be able to have and thinking right. like, oh my gosh, like how am I going to do this? How am I going to have variety? Because you can't just eat the same five things forever. And I really was thinking about it past the 30 days. Like it's supposed to be a 30 day thing, but I was really thinking long term because I have been on this journey and working on it for a few years. And I do want to be caring for my body better. So I was not just thinking about it in 30 day terms. So I was like, well, you can't just eat like a handful of things forever. Like you have to have some variety, but I was so focused on all the things that were going to be taken away. And then I thought, okay, you know what? I'm making the commitment to do this. I need to spend the time find some recipes that interest me and make the commitment to going to the store, getting the food, having it on hand, right? Really setting myself up for success. And to be honest, I was kind of blown away at how easy it was. And I found some incredible recipes, you know, just in that small time frame. I found so many great things that were also very easy because that is my audience knows me. I talk all the time about I am lazy. I always want a shortcut. I'm extremely busy. I need it to be fast. I need it to be simple. I don't want to have a huge cleanup which is part of how I got myself in trouble with fast food and picking up food because it's just the convenience and simplicity of it. And But I really found some incredible things. I found some great ways to snack. And it was the first time that I actually saw a difference in my waistline because just giving up sugar did not do that for me. <laughs> yeah, yes, I believe you totally, yes. And it, giving up sugar, you know, that expression, giving up, for me, it started out as giving up, although it was supposed to be a temporary thing. And it ended up as letting go in a much more positive way of finding that freedom and not just freedom from the hold that sugar has on us and the cravings and even the hold that the processed foods industry has on us. But it's this freedom from needing those types of processed foods for any sort of emotional crutch. Mm -hmm. And it actually forced me to grow up mm -hmm. <laughs> and deal with my emotions like the big girl that I am. And I fought against that big time, you know, and all these sort of self-sabotage things that we tell ourselves, you know, what am I going to eat? I can't eat the same five things for the rest of my life. It's all self-sabotage. I mean, I did it yeah. for the longest time, yeah. all a way for us not to change, to keep comfortable in our discomfort and to not do the hard thing, which in the end is actually becomes not just easy. It just becomes second nature. Absolutely. And looking after ourselves becomes second nature. And to me, that's where the real joy comes from, because I hated myself 
for so much of my adult life. When I was in active alcoholism, I was not a good person in a lot of ways. I was a very crappy person and I hated myself. I just loathed myself. And now to be in this whole other place in my life and to have worked so hard for so many years to grow into a different person, nothing to me feels better than actually caring for myself. Like I love me now and I want to take care of me. And I never had that feeling before, right? And that goes for food as much as it goes for hygiene or skincare. Like I love the act of caring for myself. Yes. And it's a big, big challenge for us as women and for mothers specifically. It's a big challenge to have self-care, look after yourself without feeling selfish. Mm, Yeah. And so when people come to see me for help to to stop eating sugar, in the end, they come in talking about sugar. And really what we talk about 90% of the time is you know, um, self-care, uh, coping skills, self-love, uh, re- relaxation skills, stress management, all that stuff that I'm sure alcohol and any other type of substance that we use, sugar, as much as those other substances, actually stops us from taking care of, of ourselves and actually facing what it is that we need to, to make peace with so that we can put ourselves first. Yeah. And that doesn't mean ignoring other people. Mm -hmm. It means once, you know, it's like the oxygen mask on a plane. You put on your mask first so that you can take care of others. Right. This is a really good point that you bring up too for people with kids, for sure. I don't have kids, but I, I have a whole slew of nieces and nephews that I am super involved with and just adore them. And I have two of my nephews every Friday. And when I was doing Whole30, Friday was the hardest part, right? Because it's kids and we're playing and like there's barely time to even drink water on Fridays when I'm with them because kids are all consuming. But then it's also the snack the crackers, the, you know, all the little things that they're eating. And those Fridays for me were one of the greatest challenges where I really had to be mindful of taking food with me that was snacky, right? That I could eat while playing with them and taking care of them and whatever. But it was hard. And I would imagine being in a home with children with all of the best bad foods, <laughs> it would be ultra challenging to stay focused on not eating that stuff when it's all around you. True. Yes, it is. It does require a high level of mindfulness at first first, while we're making that change. And then it becomes automatic, second nature. um, And it's not a big deal anymore. But only once we've gone through that period of any change, you know, I'm a teacher in my career and any change, any new learning is an effort. Yes. Yes. A hundred percent. Now, does your body actually need a detox from sugar? Because I see this all over social media, people doing detox programs, detox from sugar, take this, drink this, whatever. Is that a necessary piece of moving away from sugar? It depends, I think, I've found, it depends on your natural personality. So the way I approach it to help people is I ask them, what kind of natural personality do you have? When you approach any kind of new project, do you like to go all in, all at once, black or white, you know, even for like your opinions or, you know, what kind of a person are you? If that's what you're like, then you're probably better off like going cold turkey because that just fits your personality more. Whereas some other people are more step by step, gradually. um, And so maybe cutting sugar gradually fits them more. And sometimes obviously you're in between or for some stage of your life, you're like one type Mm -hmm. and then you, there's not just two types of person, of people, obviously, but you know, um, so I find that if you, 
decide to cut sugar, you're better off going with how you naturally are anyway. Right. Otherwise, you can't keep it up. It won't be sustainable. Right. And as for detox, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about the the term detox, um, because, you know, they say it's the do- the dose that makes the poison. And so sugar in and of itself is not necessarily toxic. It's the amount that we consume that in a greater amount, sugar, and I include flour in that actually, uh, becomes unhealthy for your body and your brain. And it may happen. No, it doesn't happen to everyone. You know, I told you it happened to me where my body kind of just checked out for a while when it wasn't getting the, the glucose surge that it was used to getting for its energy. And for some people that happens, for some people it doesn't. But I don't think you need, personally, I don't think you need any pills, powders or juices to detox from sugar. What you need is to stop eating it. <laughs> right. And it is different, right? Because I've used both techniques in, and I keep saying it's been a journey, right? Because I've really been on this food journey for about probably six years now, I think. And maybe a little bit longer than that, but where I had a period of my life that I gained some weight and it was the first time ever in my life that I had fluctuated weight that it wouldn't come off. Right? Like I couldn't lose it. My whole life I've gone up and down a little bit, but it's always been very manageable and whatever few pounds I put on, I could lose very easily without much effort. And all of a sudden in my late forties, that was not the case. I had gained more than I had ever gained before. A lot of it was emotional. I think now knowing what I know today and looking back, I think it was probably the beginning of my hormones getting out of whack, my thyroid, um, all of those things, which now I have gotten I've learned and gotten under control, but it was just a combination of all these things. So all of a sudden I had to be conscious about my food intake and I had never had to think about it before, but I've done both ways where certain things I've done very slowly, you know, like in the big picture of eating better, I started with just implementing very small kind of rules, very simple things also very simple things that already worked with who I am and my lifestyle. So at first it wasn't super hard. Like the first thing I did was I don't eat after 6 p.m. And that was just easy for me. I go to bed very early. I get up at 4.30 in the morning, right? So I don't, I don't want to consume food and then be asleep two hours later. So that was a pretty easy one for me. But I started just implementing things very slowly and getting good at them And being where I'm at today, I can look back on all of those different things that I did and I can see how valuable every piece of it was because I was practicing my own skills of commitment and dedication and getting good at and following through, right? Those were all the skills that I needed to get to a place to really take the plunge and do something like a whole 30 and and stick with it more, right? But it all was so valuable. And doing the whole 30 thing was taking the plunge. And, you know, the majority of us, certainly people with addiction, the majority of us, we are very much like we are 100% in or we are 100% out. But you have yep. to be careful with that because it can also not be sustainable. We can do Absolutely. it for a little while and then fall off. And now as I am implementing changes, I want it to be long term. So I just, I'm much more thoughtful about it. And I'm willing to put in the time and energy and effort where a few years ago I wasn't, you know, not at, right. not at this yes. level. Right. Yes. It, it really does depend on where you are in your life. And it's not just a question of, oh, okay, I'll just stop eating sugar and then it's done. It wasn't like that for me and I've not met anyone for whom it was just like a one and done decision. But, you know, I think that one of the, the things that you said about making like micro changes, atomic habit changes, Mm -hmm. as James Clear says, it's, it's wonderful because it's not overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And it's doable. And then it doesn't, 
it like you look back and you realize just how far you've come in quite a short time, but it doesn't feel like a diet or, you know, the diet mentality, I've got a bone to pick with them as well, the diet mentality that has us believing that, you know, we can only be healthy if we follow 101 different types of rules. And I find that takes away our personal power to actually decide, hey, what's good for me? I think I'll decide that. Thank you very much. And part of that being responsible for our own decisions is also being educated about human biology, Mm -hmm. not just how awful sugar is for your body, because then I find that people who um, like just see sugar as a poison or villainize sugar, they are still maintaining an an emotional connection to sugar. It's just negative Mm -hmm. emotion. Mm -hmm. Whereas I I like to bring people to a peaceful, neutral relationship with sugar where they don't actually care about it. It's off their radar. And so it's like once you get to a point where you can see that sugar is not actually doing you any good, or the good that you thought it was doing you, you know, the soothing, the reward, the, you know, in case you're bored or sad or emotional in any way, sugar's right there for you, you know, ask me how mm-hmm. I know. <laughs> but once you found other ways for self-care, for coping skills, to look after yourself and your valid emotional needs, then you just don't need or want sugar anymore. Mm-hmm. And the other thing that I found, uh, talking about small habit changes and mindset shifts, huge mindset shifts, but actually that can happen in in a few seconds. Um, Another thing that is that my tastes changed, and people have told me this all the time, the less sweetness the tongue has over time, the more sensitive our taste buds become, and even the slightest sweet taste is overpowering. And so what happens is when we, I I ask people to train their taste buds to get used to less and less sweetness. And in that way, just naturally, you're not always running after sweet tastes or Mm -hmm. or the, the sugars or the sweetness that you were referring to, because you're not looking for sweetness. Your tastes, and my tastes anyway, I actually dislike sweet tastes now. And remember, I was like number one sweet tooth. I pray for that to happen to me. (laughs) It will happen if you let it happen. In other words, if you stop feeding your sweet tooth with sweet tastes, it will happen. Yeah. You know, something you mentioned too is the diet mentality and the 101 things. And that was something for me that was very defeating because I felt like like there were so many rules and I'm like, how can you do all the rules of, you know, no sugar, no dairy, you know, don't eat after a certain time, don't eat before this time in the morning, you need to fast, you need to not have this and not have that. And like, there's so much stuff and I, in the, count calories, don't count calories, don't eat carbs. I mean, it's just, it, it, was so defeating for me because I got in this mental place with food where all food was the enemy, right? Like there was something, if you get into that sort of diet culture enough, I mean, it's like all you can eat is chicken breast and broccoli and drink water, you know? And and then like everything I would try to do, I felt like I was failing because everything I did was wrong, quote unquote, in some way. And yes, yes. The diet culture has failure built into it. For sure. And I don't use that word diet. Like even when I talk about whole 30, they call it an elimination diet, but I always say meal plan or my way of eating. You know, I always use that alternative language because I don't, it's not a diet. I don't want it to be temporary. I'm not just doing it long enough to achieve something and then go on to something else, right? I want it to be sustainable. So it is, I mean, it's a meal plan to me. Yeah, it's, yes, it's, it's life. It's a life, lifestyle, people call it as well. And for me, you know, do you think that I would still be happily, the operative word, happily sugar-free for the last almost eight years 
if I was white knuckling yeah, it right, through. Right. Like who I couldn't live that way. No. I wouldn't want to live that way. And there is no way. Like people imagine that not eating sugar is like a joyless, sad, <laughs> dull life. Yeah. And then they meet me and they see me and they're like, oh, wait a minute, she looks happy enough. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and and my life is much happier and more joyful and calmer since I stopped eating sugar. And again, I didn't just stop eating sugar. I replaced it mm -hmm. with self-care, self-love, and it it changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to mention also, because I keep talking about Whole30, so I figure I should probably tell people what that is. Um, and this is just my tip of the iceberg understanding. Whole30 is eating whole foods in their whole form. So meats, fruits, vegetables, nuts, um, but just whole foods in their whole forms instead of, again, like pre- prepared things with a list of ingredients and tons of preservatives and added additives and added sugars, um, just whole foods in their whole forms. So yeah, what we call food, what we call yeah. food. And it's a bit crazy. I find that we have to specify that whole foods are whole foods, you know, as opposed to everything else that's in the grocery store that, I, you know, that Michael Pollan calls them something like, um, you know, edible food like product. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. But it has been cool. I mean, there are things to make it easier now. Also, you know, there were, there are a lot, my girlfriend that I did it with, she found uh, an online market. Well, she found a lot of resources that made it much more easy and enjoyable, right? Where there are a ton of Whole30 approved foods. And, right. and that was super helpful to have some different flavor profiles and condiments and things like that, because that was a lot of the stuff that I was thinking about was like, okay, so I'm just having like some sort of plain piece of meat and some sort of vegetable every day. Like that's what I'm eating. Because again, that to me is not sustainable. Like there does, yeah. I do need to enjoy my food on some level or I'm not even going to want to eat. Right. Which is then going to lead to a binge. So right. <laughs> there's right. a lot of, a lot of the people, A lot of the people that I help have actually become foodies mm -hmm. since they cut sugar. Because what they've done is they've discovered actual real foods, real flavors, not manufactured in a lab they're learning how to make sauces yeah. and marinades and stuff like that and I think our taste buds as much as our brains have been hijacked by the processed foods industry to just not know what real food actually tastes like mm -hmm. and then yeah and you were saying you know we don't know we don't have any ideas any imagination of what to make because that also we've never had the chance to learn anything about cooking. And honestly, you don't have to be master chef to be sugar-free. You know, you just need to reignite that old skill of not just cooking, but imagination. Yeah. And I promise you, if I can do this, like anybody can do this, because I really am the queen of convenience. Like I need it to be fast and easy. That's just who I am because otherwise I will not do it. So I was looking up a lot of recipes that were like one pan meals, you know, and things like that, where I could just do it, put it together. I did learn to make some pretty awesome sauces that were so much fun. And yeah, it's actually been really enjoyable. I'm so grateful that my girlfriend asked me to do it. And it, it's definitely, it's been inspiring, you know, to make that kind of change. And did you carry on after 30 days? Yeah. Yeah, I have. I mean, I definitely, I'll tell you, this is something I wanted to talk to you about too, because the hardest time for me in the whole thing was as it was coming to an end, as the 30 days was coming to an end, right? And I knew my commitment was fulfilled, right? Because that's what I agreed to do. Now, I already knew that I really wanted to carry on a lot of these habits for the long term, for sure. But the last five days were so hard for me. And I started obsessing about all the things, right? Like I want this meal at this restaurant. I want grilled cheese sandwich at this bistro. I want, you know, like I just started obsessing yeah. about all the foods that I hadn't had. I'll tell you a saving grace for me on Whole30 is that you can have potatoes. And I am 
French fry obsessed. So to be able to cut potatoes, put them in my air fryer and have that was an absolute lifesaver to be able to have potatoes mm -hmm. and sweet potatoes. Um, because I don't, I don't do a lot of fried food and I love French fries, but it's one of the few fried things that I would ever eat because it just kind of fried foods kind of make me sick to my stomach. But yeah, it was just interesting that the hardest part of all of it was as I was approaching the end and my brain shifted to just obsessing about the foods I hadn't had that I hadn't even thought about the rest out yeah. of the three plus yeah. weeks, you know? Yes, yes, it'll do that. Yes, self-sabotage rears its ugly head again. Yes, yeah, it's, you know, it's a normal part of the process. And, you know, to a certain degree, the what I sort of help people with is letting go of all those rules and making, not even making your own rules, but stepping out of that whole rule paradigm that, again, I sort of blame the diet culture for where you know where we they come along and they say well Netta I cheated which is again a diet thing so I have to start all over again you know let's say it's whole 30 which is similar to to kind of what I help people with well let's say you so-called cheat at day 28 and they get you to start from the beginning again and I'm like just that the whole concept of cheating um, and falling off the wagon that is so diety it's like yeah. I just reject it all you just carry on you did this right and you carry on and I did um I did in the, the last like the second to last day or something I had a cheeseburger and french fries and I was out with my family and a couple of my nephews and we'd gone to the aquarium and we were out all day long <laughs> and I'm with them and it was time to stop and get something to eat and feed the little ones. And I was, you know, of course we were not anywhere that had any kind of healthy food. And I did, I, I made the decision that that's what I was going to eat. And I told my girlfriend, I was like, listen, I'll let you know, I had a cheeseburger and fries. It wasn't even good. You know, it's not like I was in a good place, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I did. Yeah. And I didn't stress about it. I thought I would have a bigger reaction to it or like be disappointed in myself. But I really was able to just go, yeah, whatever, dude. It was one meal. It's not the end of the world. Right. You know, it's just really not that big of a deal. And especially yeah. as well as I had done. So yeah, I really just picked up and moved on. Fantastic. Fantastic. And this is a big thing that I help people with is self-compassion. I'm way more interested in how you feel than in what you eat. Because, you know, you, that, this whole concept of orthorexia where you eat right and yes. you eat healthy and you're feeling like crap about yourself anyway. Yeah. I don't get it. I well, don't get I'm going to ask you, most people don't know that term. So I would love it if you would take a minute and explain that. I'm very big on giving my audience all the details and not speaking in code. So most people are not familiar okay. with that term. If you could break that down for us. Sure. So orthorexia is basically, this is my definition, having an unhealthy relationship with healthy food and taking healthiness to the extreme where it becomes unhealthy. And what I consider to be healthy has little to do with what's on your plate and everything to do with what's in your head. And so if you're stressing and feeling like a failure and, you know, beating yourself up about what you ate or you didn't eat or you want to eat or you don't want to eat, it's that, how can that be healthy? Yeah. You know, so I help people actually develop a healthier relationship with themselves and with sugar so that it doesn't become this sort of unhealthy crutch that... Right you know, that it used to be. Yeah. Is that okay as a definition? Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I just want everybody to know what it means because that's not a common term. I only knew that term because I had a client, I don't know, probably four or five years ago and he was orthorexic and he literally would not eat outside of his house. Like he would not go to a restaurant. He would not buy any kind of food like at the gym, like anywhere. He would only eat what he would cook. And 
it really had such a drastic effect on his life, right? And his connections with people, because so much of what you're doing is going out to eat or, Hey, let's go yeah. get a coffee. Or, let's go grab breakfast. Like whatever the thing is, especially as sober people, your social There's events me. really start to revolve around <laughs> food things, you know? And yeah, that's the only reason that I knew that terminology just because I had worked with yeah. someone, but you don't see it a lot. Even in social media, you don't see it a lot. No, you don't hear about it a lot. And you know, you're saying that, you know, eating is a very social activity. And uh, for me, it's a very joyful activity. Mm -hmm. When I cut sugar over time, I felt less and less hungry, less and less often, which means that I naturally do intermittent fasting, but I'd never heard of it. And I didn't know I was doing it. I was just like, oh, well, hang on, I'm not getting hungry every three hours, you know. Um, and there's a biological reason for that. But my point being that I've now found that I enjoy my food even more than before. I enjoy social situations even more than before, whether or not I'm actually eating anything. It, yes. it Having cut sugar and not eating as often has made me more aware of who I'm celebrating with or who I'm in a social situation with, the who more than the food. And that doesn't mean that food isn't important. It just means that I was, I've become more aware of the reason why we're celebrating together, if it's a celebration, for example. And whether or not there's cake, it just it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it doesn't, I mean, certainly desserts, like it doesn't affect the time that I have with my people, right? Like having a dessert does not make our visit better. You know, it doesn't make our connection more valuable. Um, so I was pretty good with that. One of my unhealthy parts with food is I used food as such a source of joy. And like I had all of these emotional attachments to food and all these expectations that food is going to give me this a great joy in connection with people. And it was like the focus was always on the food. And you're exactly right. Like you shift that focus to be more about who you're with and less about what's going in your mouth, right? And it doesn't change anything. It really doesn't change anything. Yes, and it certainly doesn't change the the joy of eating. It's still there. It's just not 100% responsible for your personal joy. Yes, exactly. Oh, I love that. This has been such an amazing conversation. Thank you again for coming on and doing this with me. I would love for us to do a follow-up and talk, like focus on gut health. Yeah. And all that, all that good stuff. That's a good thing I, for me. Yeah, yeah. I love that stuff now that I've been learning more about it. But thank you, Netta, so much. Where can people find you? All right. So um my sort of brand name, if you will, is Life After Sugar. And I have a website, it's aftersugarclub.com. Also, free resources on my website. I have my Instagram at my life after sugar. I'm um, I have a YouTube channel for life after sugar. I just joined TikTok. I don't know what I'm doing there. But <laughs> it's my kid. She gave me a. She says, "Mom, I made you a TikTok oh, account." Wow. I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> okay, cool." I'm pretty much everywhere. Okay, and I will link some of that in the show notes too, so people can link to you. Also, thank you again. Really appreciate this conversation. You're so welcome. Thank you. You've reached the end of another great episode of the Addiction Unlimited podcast, candid and honest conversation about addiction and recovery. Be sure to visit us at addictionunlimited.com to join the conversation and access show notes and links to everything we talked about. Love this episode? Please take 30 seconds to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes to help us improve and give you the information you want. Thanks for listening. See you next week.